Welcome to the Rock is George podcast. I'm your host, George Dion, and this is episode 48. Thank you for tuning in at rockisgeorge.com, anchor.fm slash rockisgeorge, youtube.com, or knac.com. We're expanding, and I'm glad that you're a part of it. My special guest for this episode is Dan Reed of Dan Reed Network. They have a new album out. It's called Let's Hear It for the King. It's out on Drakkar Entertainment on June 17th. Before we get into all that, let me give you a brief history on the group. Dan Reed Network cut their teeth on the local scene from 1984 to 1986. Eventually, they caught the attention of Derek Schulman, who was riding high off signing Bon Jovi and Cinderella, and he snatched up the Dan Reed Network. They got a deal with Polygram and Mercury Records in their first album came out in 1987. It was self-titled, produced by Bon Jovi producer Bruce Fairbairn. From there, they followed up that album with Slam, produced by the legendary chick front man, Niall Rogers. Their third album came out in 1991, produced again by Bruce Fairbairn, called The Heat. Shortly after that, the band broke up. They reunited for their 25th anniversary, in 2012 and they started making new music again once again their latest album is called let's hear it for the king here's dan reed of dan reed network if i knew absolutely nothing about dan reed network how would you describe the band's music to me i'd say it's rock and roll with a tinge of funk yeah i would just say it's rock and roll to me um i have a hard time defining stuff um, back in the day, they used to say we were a mixture between Aerosmith and Prince, and I always thought that was a good combination. So I'll go with that. <laughs> I'd agree with that for sure. And your latest album, uh, Let's Hear for the King, it comes out June 17th on Drakkar Entertainment. It's been a little bit since you guys released the studio album. Yeah, it has been. Yeah, it's, I think the last one was with Frontiers, basically, um, 2016. And then we did another album that we released on our own, which was a mixture of songs that we did in uh, different studios around the world with a live audience. So they all got to sing on the track. We did uh, Stockholm, Berlin, uh, New York, Portland, um, one other, oh, uh, Manchester, that we started off in Manchester in the UK. So that was uh, not really a proper studio album. It was more of like a fun project that we did. On the new album, you have a little short film that kind of goes along with with the album. I think you incorporate at least four of the songs from the album into this short film. So if you want to go a little into that. Yeah, that's uh, started off as like um, we wanted to do kind of a mini Purple Rain thing where we had like all the band guys in the film and acting in it and all what have you. But COVID hit. So we, we shot it in August in Prague. And Brian, my guitar player, was the only one that could get here because he was living up in Sweden at the time. So that turned into more of a a proper dramatic film rather than a promo piece for the album. So now we're working on turning it into a feature. The script has been written. We're putting all together the cast and crew right now. Hopefully be shooting that later this year or early next year. Other than the people that are on our Patreon page, I don't know if the full film will be released until the feature film is out because it kind of gives away part of the story. So, but we are releasing the song bits. So people will get to see the title track from our album that's here for the King, that number um, in next month in June. Excellent. Are these four songs related or did they just happen to come together when you started putting together this film story? They're kind of, the whole album is a bit related to me. I spent all 2019 writing the lyrics for this record and it all had a theme of what do we do with all of this kind of social media stardom that everybody has access to now. Um, This kind of ego driven society more and more since the invention of social media. Um, What do we do with that energy? Do we do it just to feed our you know, self-interest or do we, is it actually bringing us together as a global community to where we can meet aliens someday? Cause that's my hope. <laughs> my hope is that the human race uh, earns its, earns its right to uh, become part of the global community or a uh, universal community rather. 
and hopefully we're we're the most intelligent ones <laughs> yeah just, i have doubts about that but uh yeah hopefully i i just hope that we're invited to the table someday you know I can imagine if I was an advanced species going, are they still killing each other over religion down there? Yeah, they are for the moment. Yeah. So have you always been fascinated with aliens and, and the supernatural? Yeah, I have ever since I was a kid, I believe I saw a UFO when I was like nine years old it was my first time. I've seen a couple since had tons and tons of conversations with people that have had experiences, uh, telepathic experiences, a couple who said they've actually physically met them. Um, over the years, probably because I ask those kind of questions when we start chit-chatting about UFOs or whatever, or even sci science fiction films that we love. They, everybody seems to, like every person that's a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan, they all secretly hope that maybe that's true, you know, we all kind of pine for the day when we can meet other species, you know, from other planets. Now you say that you explore sort of the negative aspects of social media fame in this album, but you do have sort of points of hope, at least with the track I See Angels. Yeah, for sure. I, I think humanity as a whole, if you were to, I mean, I've traveled enough in India, the Middle East, uh, South America, um, Asia a bit, I've, in all the States, of course, and all of Europe. And everywhere I've gone, as a half, I'm half Filipino, a quarter Native American and a quarter German. That's my physical makeup. Everywhere I've gone, whether it's white people, black people, you know, mid-tone people, whatever, whatever religion, you know, Jewish, Muslim, Hindi, Tibetan, monks, uh, everywhere I've gone, I've been treated 97% of the time wonderfully and beautifully. So I think 90% of the human race is, are good people and want to, just raise their family in a safe environment and be able to pay their bills. I think there's 3% that are maniacal evil bastards that would just want to collect all the much as much money as they can. And they don't care if people die on the path of getting there. I'd say we're, we're the majority. So I have hope for humanity. I do very much so. So even in those songs where I'm kind of lambasting social media stuff, I'm trying to do it with some hope in each lyric you know i don't i don't claim the world is a piece of shit i try to say sometimes it can be but uh we have each other type vibe i always try to point in that direction and i see angels oddly enough was the one song on the record that was written by brian i did write a few lyrics for it brian james is the more optimist in our band than anybody so, so social media is sort of a double-edged sword for a working band these days i mean it's certainly different than when you guys were coming up and there wasn't that much fan interaction unless they came to the shows, but now you sort of have to be a part of it to get the music out, to get the message out. I enjoy it. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think I maybe enjoy it more now because I got kind of out of the politics. I was for, I'd say, 2008 to 2018, 19, somewhere in there. I was quite active on social media about posting my thoughts, opinions, insights that I've learned from different people along the way when it comes to social interaction and issues and what have you. I didn't know how toxic that was for me because if somebody posts something positive, it kind of feeds your, your spirit that, oh, I'm doing a good thing or I'm doing the right thing by writing some of this stuff. And then if somebody says something negative, I always tried to find middle ground with them rather than going to screw you mode how dare you contradict my point of view? I would always be like, huh, interesting. Tell me more about that. And, but I spent hours and hours and hours every week and month and years for doing that. And I don't think much was ever accomplished doing it that way. I think it's much more can be done by putting a lyric in a song for opening people's minds than preaching about it all the goddamn time. So before COVID hit, I tuned out, I got rid of my news apps, you know, CNN and MSNBC and yeah, just everything. I got rid of it all because I had definitely lean liberal, still do, and didn't comment on politics anymore toward the end of Trump's era. And then when the election, when they X'd out people like Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie, they burned him again and threw, you know, threw him under the bus. So I was like, okay, you guys, I'm out. I, I don't believe in pol political solutions so much anymore. I believe in artistic solutions and more uh, meditation and the new age family more than I do what what I think politics can do. That's kind of where I'm standing now. It'll be different next year. <laughs> <laughs> the new album is coming out on uh, Drakkar Entertainment. How did you guys end up signing with them? 
Michael Kramer, our old publisher from, I think it was Phonogram in Germany back then, but it was Polygram, Mercury in the States. And then I, Mercury and Polygram were owned by Phonogram, or I can't remember the hierarchy there, but Michael Kramer was our publisher based out of Germany 33 years ago when we first came out. And we just always stayed in touch. We got uh, really reconnected, I think, on MySpace back like <laughs> so 13 years ago or something, 14 years. And, um, and then when I started coming and doing solo music again, Michael was right there at the shows and coming over to Prague to visit me. And we'd go over to Germany and play shows there and visit with him. And then when we started recording this album, we sent him the, the tracks and he just loved it. He goes, dude, this is probably one of your best records you've made. So why don't we try to go out and find a deal for it? So it was him that introduced us to Drakkar. Was there something that happened with Frontiers? Because as you mentioned, they released your 2014 album, Fight Another Day. And it's not usually a one and done deal at Frontiers Music. Yeah, that wasn't supposed to be either, but it was under my impression that it was a one and done. And so we started recording that those tracks for Origins and that put uh, a stone in their throat. They got pretty upset about that. And I wasn't, uh, a, and I tried to remedy it as much as possible. And eventually we found middle ground. Um, they did, when I finished this album, they did come and offer us a deal for this, uh, let's hear it for the king. So there's, there's no bad blood there. I just think uh, Frontiers is an interesting beast. I, I commend them for how much they help bands. And then there's also some other, other stories that where bands had a bad experience. But for me, I, I get along with all those guys. Fine. You have a 2022 UK tour, which has been delayed for the summer portion of it because there's a band member that's having surgery. You're hoping to kick back up in the fall? Absolutely. So we're waiting for him to recover fully. The doctor said that uh, we could get out there and play, but it does, it didn't make any sense to rush it and push it and risk anything. So we want to give him a couple more months. Do you have any indication of how much of the new album you're going to try to play live? Yeah, six, uh, six songs for sure. We think that usually when you put a new album out, I think bands play maybe two songs off the new record. That's kind of their thing, right? Um, but we think this record is strong enough and people have had to live with our older catalog long enough that uh, it, it, I think it deserves to be played live at half the album. So we'll probably play like 16 song sets. So we'll play 10 classics and six new ones for you. You'll have a ball. Are you going to be able to make your way to the States? I know that the States haven't exactly been the best market for Dan Reed Network. And, you know, usually, you know, I think you're over, you're over in Prague. Probably not easy to get a, a tour put together in the United States. Well, we've talked about it for this album, for sure. You know, we're also friends with bands like Extreme. And if they go out on tour, we're hoping maybe we can hop on the, with them. We've been trying to get on the Monsters of Rock cruise for the last six, seven years and haven't been able to arrange that. But I feel that if we do get over there and get to play in front of uh, people, um, instead of playing like for, you know, 10 people in a club, great to play for 100, 150. That will build into 200 and keep growing. And if we can make it at least break even. Um, we would love to get back over to the States. We love playing in New York and Cleveland and L.A., Seattle, Portland, of course. But uh, we'd like to get into some other cities that we haven't been to for, what, 25 years more? So Let's Hear It For The King is coming out on uh, multiple formats. Uh, vinyl seems to be making a resurgence. You sold out of uh, the first 100 press of a pink vinyl, I believe, and you got more vinyl available. But uh, there's a little issue with U.S. distribution of such a, such a product? Yeah, well, we got, it. we got a link now where people... I will get that sent to you, or, and I'll definitely post it on my socials where people in the States can buy the CD um, and have it distributed from there as opposed to from England because the, with Brexit, everything's crazy expensive. But not the box sets and not the vinyl yet, unfortunately. But they said after June 17th, they hope to be able to have a distributor set up for the vinyl and the box sets in the U.S. Uh, with your Patreon page, you release kind of exclusive content to your fans. What, what could someone expect by purchasing a, uh, I guess, a pass on Patreon. Usually there's uh, show benefits. Like if we were touring right now, you could you get free tickets and come down for, you know, no price or bring guests and all that kind of stuff. Um, meet the band, hang out. But since we're not doing shows right now, we're trying to do content that is number one from the film we talked about. They're getting to see snippets from the film, the song elements. We do videos. Uh, I'm going to do a little acoustic concert here next week to record just for the Patreon 
like an hour long set of me just singing here in my studio and with song requests from them. Yeah, so, so far they've been getting to see like music videos that we've done just for Patreon from this new album, like Just Might Get It, um, Last Day on Saturn, songs like that. We did some videos just for them. They've been so supportive and they've been there. You know, we started the Patreon February, 2020. Next month, COVID hit. And, it was, <laughs> and, and those, those people that joined up back in 2020, I'd say 95% of them are, there, are still there supporting these last two years. So they knew that, the, that a lot of that was going into helping us make the film, um, make our music videos. So they're, they're awesome, they're really magic. And then we have this great, uh, great group on Facebook called the Dan Reed Networkers which is run by Jules Carley. I think she has 3,000, 4,000 people over there now from all over the world that were into our music or still are. We post like everything there days early before it goes public, ticket uh, deals for shows that are going to be coming up. I got a 18th, or it's February 18th next year is my 60th birthday. And so we're going to have a concert here in Prague. So the networkers and the Patreon people get access to those tickets before everybody else vip stuff all that so we try to try to do as much as we can without doing many shows dan reed network kind of disbanded in the early 90s shortly after the release of the heat uh you reunited in 2012 for the 25th anniversary what brought the band back together was it just strictly the nostalgia of the anniversary or was there something else did you miss it yeah that's interesting um the keyboard player Blake Sakamoto who's not in the band now he was for a decade trying to convince us to get back together to do a show preferably some kind of big party and I think with the hopes that we would all miss it and love it and start playing again and then that never really happened until 2012 in 2011 uh, Blake and this promoter in Portland named Bart Haifman had a New Year's Eve party and remember all the rumors of the world was going to end on New Year's Eve 2012 so we thought what a funny thing that we play our first gig back together when the world ends. <laughs> so he, uh, Bart said he'd do it. I got a hold of the band guys. We rehearsed for a couple of days and then we played the show with no plans on doing any shows after that. It was just a one-off. And then Brian and I sat in the hotel room. I guess it was about four in the morning at New Year's Eve after the show. And we're sitting out in the balcony and having a shot of whiskey. And we just went, that was like the best time. We just had the best time. And he goes, you want to do another one? I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we booked a few shows in Europe, like eight shows. People showed up. We had a great time. And we said, well, let's do another tour. So we did one in 2014, 15. And then we said, if we're going to keep doing this, we might as well, let's make a record. See if we still got any of that in us. So we made Fight Another Day, which I think was a good step forward from being uh, definitely a good step after a 16, 17 year hiatus. That, that convinced us that, oh, let's make some more music. So we did the songs and origins, but it was such a, a chaotic process of recording it in these different studios around the world. It was never really a focused thing. And then this album, when we spent a whole year writing it, as opposed to three months, let's hear it for the King. So now we feel like this is maybe our, it's our favorite album out of all the albums we've made. And not because it's our latest one, but because we feel it, it definitely visits the, our old roots a bit. It has some hope in it. Um, it's not too idealistic. It just feels like a really fun, strong record to play live. So now we want to make another one. We're already working on 12, 10 to 12 new tracks. So <laughs> we'll see when we get that done. I would have thought after the lockdowns, you'd have about three albums done. Yeah, well, I was working on a <laughs> film the whole time. It was, that was crazy amount of work, you know. I thought making music was tough, but nope. <laughs> <laughs> In 2019, uh, Universal Music Germany uh, reissued your first album, the self-titled 88 yeah. debut, and Slam from yeah. 1989. Did Were you able to be involved in the process? Just in the sense of getting a hold of Niall, Niall Rogers, who helped remaster that with his guy, uh, Abbey Road Studios in London. We talked to him, tried to make sure that he, you know, if he was in on doing it, that would be awesome because Slam is probably... The people that like our music, maybe favorite album, The Slam. Having Niall's participation was uh, paramount for us wanting to do it. And so he came on board, um, Universal, foot that bill for Niall. And it, we just, other than that, we just wanted to have a tour behind it. So we went out and toured 30 year anniversary of, of uh, Slam. We went out and did it. How come Niall Rogers didn't return for the third album, The Heat? 
I think the label and everybody wanted us to go like more. They, I think the label liked that first album more than the heat. I think Niall was busy working on some, like he's always busy, but he was on another project in that window when we wanted to work. Bruce had expressed interest in wanting to work together again. And we had such a great time working on that first album with Mike Fraser as engineer and Bruce producing. We decided to go back up to Canada because that was the window that was open. And we loved working with everybody we worked with so far. That's good. Not too many guys from the 80s can say that. <laughs> yeah, I've heard horror stories. We never had any of those. Our, I don't, I'm trying to think if we have any horror stories. I mean, I got stuck on top of an elevator in a, what do you call that, atrium lobby of a hotel that went up like 30 floors. But that was my fault. I jumped on top of the elevator. So self-prescribed horrors, that's all we got. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the anniversary of Slam. You're coming up on the anniversary of your debut next year. It's the 35th anniversary. What do you remember about putting this album together? That was such a great experience because we had all these songs we were playing in the clubs. And Bruce said, you know, record a live show. I want to hear all the songs. Uh, you guys performing it live. I guess we had 20 songs around then, 25 songs. And he picked his top 10 that he wanted. And then I wrote Ritual after we got our record deal, which is oddly enough, our first single. Um, but that was written as a kind of a thank you letter to the tribe that was following us in Portland because we had this crazy loyal following, you know. So that really helped us sell our EP, which in turn got us our deal. And so it was a thank you concert we did, a free concert in this 1500 seat club, opened up with Ritual as like a thank you song. You're all that I want. You're all that I need. You are my ritual, Portland, Oregon. That was kind of where that came from. Do you have any other musical ventures besides Dan Reed Network? A lot of musicians seem to have their hands in multiple fires. Yeah, well, I'm working with Danny Vaughn, um, the lead singer of Taiketo. Um, we toured about six years ago, the first time, just for fun, trading songs back and forth. We did a second tour, which was more, even more well-attended. And then we decided, why don't we write some songs? So we did that. We made an album that came out in February of 2020. And then COVID hit. We had done three shows in Sweden and we had to cancel the rest of our tour. So we're redoing that tour, the album release tour, three years later, um, in no, end of November, early December this year. That's called Snake Oil and Harmony. And the album's called Hurricane Riders. And that's on Townsend Records out of the UK. Are you working with someone else on Frontiers? Because I swear I interviewed somebody and I couldn't I couldn't refresh my recollection that you were working with somebody else on it's, Frontiers in the project. You know, tracks here and there with, uh, uh, I don't know if you know K Khalil. He does, uh, he's put out like 30 records with Frontiers. He works with a great guitar player named Stevie, a great producer. They just had me sing uh, lead vocals on two tracks that they wrote. And I wrote the lyrics and the melodies. They were very happy with it. So they're talking about putting together another project. I know they work with Frontiers a lot. They work with FM. I was working with some of the guys from FM on a track. Um, and Sisters of Mercy, a guitar player from Sisters of Ben. Or Sister, I can't remember what, what's the name of the band. But yeah, I did a track with them over the summer. Right now I'm doing this great project called Operation Paperclip, which is uh, the brainchild of a great bassist and lyricist uh, composer named Bob Matson, based out of California. So I've sang seven songs for him so far, and I've done three or four music videos for his different projects. He has like three or four different bands. Um, so that's a great relationship that's developing. And we're talking about maybe trying to do a few charity shows because it's the whole album for Operation Paperclip is about what are the factors that lead to somebody not living in a house, not having a home being on the street, being in the forest, you know, not by their own choice, but by the circumstances. So the whole album tackles those different things, whether you're a war veteran or somebody who's, you know, got an illness and lost or lost a family member and it broke your, broke your soul to where you couldn't live in society anymore. Every song has something about that. So that's why I really wanted to do this project, I thought. And then all the proceeds from it are going to go to help different uh, shelters and uh, people that are helping with homelessness in California. Excellent. It sounds like you got your hands full and everything's going in the right direction. Uh, the uh, new album drops on June 17th. People can pre-order it now. It's called Let's Hear It for the King. It's a fantastic album. I've been listening to it all week. That's all I got for you, Dan. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Oh, man. I really enjoyed talking with you. I hope we can do it again someday. 
Absolutely. Hope to see you out in the U.S. sometime. Yeah, I would be honored. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank Dan Reed for coming on the Rock is George podcast. Be sure to check out the songs that are out now by Dan Reed Network from the album Let's Hear It for the King. Once you're done streaming those songs, make sure you go out and buy a physical copy of the album. Support the artist. You can find out everything you need to know about the Dan Reed Network at danreed-network.com. Sign up for their Patreon page, get music and access that regular fans just don't get. I want to thank Dustin Hardman of Hardman Promotions and Drakkar Entertainment for making this interview possible. You've been great. I've been George Dion. I'll see you again soon.